A magnitude 6.3 quake struck northern Afghanistan on November 2nd, 2025, sending tremors through the mountains near Kulm. At 28 kilometers, roughly 17 miles depth, this shock was shallow enough to shake the surface, yet it felt like only a taste of the brewing strain. Scientists are asking whether this event is a harbinger of a far larger rupture, and whether Afghanistan's long quiet faults might finally yield under relentless pressure. The tectonic forces and fault mechanics beneath the surface sketch a sober picture. The same collision that builds the Himalaya is loading energy into Afghanistan's crust, and the silence of the major faults may be the calm before a storm. Afghanistan's crust occupies the collision zone where the Indian plate moves northward into the relatively immobile Eurasian plate. India's northward motion, about four centimetres per year, or roughly one and a half inches per year, is among the fastest plate motions on Earth. As India presses into Asia, Afghanistan is caught in the squeeze. The regional deformation forms a broad, transpressional boundary, a zone of compression combined with side-by-side strike-slip motion that threads northeastward from the Hindu Kush mountains through Kabul and along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. On the western and southern margins, the Arabian plate also encroaches from the southwest at roughly three centimeters per year, but much of that collision is absorbed farther west by the Iranian plateau. Afghanistan's particular geological danger therefore concentrates in its eastern and central highlands, where active faults remain tightly locked by crustal compression. Beneath Afghanistan, two regimes of seismic behavior operate at different depths and with different mechanics. Far below the surface, in the Hindu Kush, the downgoing Indian lithosphere steeply subducts and in places tears and fragments. At depths commonly between 150 and 250 kilometers, the sinking slab bends, stretches, and sometimes breaks, spawning very large deep-focus earthquakes frequently in the magnitude 7 to magnitude 7.5 range. Because those ruptures occur so far beneath the surface, they seldom break the ground above. Their energy is released deep underground. The physical drivers at those depths include extreme pressure and temperature, mineral phase changes, and shear instabilities within the slab, processes collectively tied to slab detachment or slab break-off. Each deep tremor redistributes stress in the mantle and into the overlying crust, sending pulses of strain upward even as the principal rupture remains hidden. Above roughly 50 kilometers depth, the brittle upper crust hosts the surface-breaking faults that most directly shape earthquake hazard. The Chaman Fault System in the southeast is a major left lateral transform. The Herat Bamyan trends and related structures slice the west and central highlands, and the central Afghan fault zone threads through the heart of the country. These structures accommodate a mix of strike-slip and thrust motion as the crust shortens, thickens, and translates laterally. Because these faults cut brittle rocks and extend to shallow depths, ruptures there can and do propagate to the surface, producing long fault scarps, topographic offsets, and intense ground shaking. The deep and shallow regimes behave differently, but they do not act in isolation. Deep Hindu Kush earthquakes change the stress field in complex ways, sometimes increasing the Coulomb stress on overlying shallow faults and sometimes decreasing it. A large deep event can thus nudge a nearby shallow fault closer to failure or temporarily make it less likely to slip, depending on geometry and timing. The interplay of elastic stress transfer viscous relaxation in the lower crust, and heterogeneous fault strengths produces a constantly evolving map of conditional probabilities for rupture. In the long arc of tectonic loading, the shallow crust bears the accumulation of elastic strain that has not been relieved 
by surface ruptures. When seismologists examine Afghanistan's historical seismicity, an unsettling pattern emerges. Nearly all of the large magnitude events recorded since the 19th century have been either deep Hindu Kush shocks or older shallow ruptures. There have been eight earthquakes of moment, magnitude, seven or greater in Afghanistan since the 1800s. Five of these were deep Hindu Kush events, all occurring since the 1980s, leaving just three large shallow shocks in the historical catalogue. The last major shallow rupture occurred in 1956, when a moment magnitude 7.3 earthquake struck the Baglan Bamyan region. That rupture occurred along a northeast trending patch of upper crust, roughly 50 kilometers long, and propagated in an area adjacent to the long Herat Fault, itself an east-west wrench fault extending on the order of 1,100 kilometers. Remarkably, the Herat Fault didn't show a major break during that event and has no recorded large earthquake in the modern instrumental era, indicating sizable fault segments remain unruptured and capable of future failure. Since the mid-1950s, the shallow crust of Afghanistan has been unnervingly quiet. No moment magnitude 7 or greater shallow event has shattered the surface in nearly 70 years. By contrast, the Hindu Kush has experienced repeated deep shocks in the intervening decades including large measured events in the 1980s, in 2002, and a particularly significant deep event in 2015. Those deep ruptures were well below 150 kilometers and did not break the ground above. The long interval of shallow silence implies that strain continues to accumulate in the upper crust, as the plates persist in their convergence at rates on the order of three to four centimeters per year. Locked continental faults that have not ruptured for many decades or centuries can store enormous elastic energy. When such faults finally fail, the released seismic energy scales steeply with rupture area and slip. A single unit increase in magnitude corresponds to roughly 32 times more energy release. In crude terms, a magnitude 8 earthquake can release an order of magnitude tens of times more energy than a magnitude 7 event. That scaling means a shallow magnitude. Eight or larger rupture in Afghanistan would not be a simple amplification of past events, but a qualitatively different geophysical phenomenon, capable of producing ruptures of hundreds of kilometers and generating long-period ground motions across broad regions. Local geology would shape how that energy translated into surface phenomena. Afghanistan's mountain ranges are composed largely of brittle Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary sequences and limestone thrust sheets bedded and folded into steep scarps. A long, shallow rupture cutting through such rocks would be primed to trigger massive slope failures and rock avalanches in mountain valleys. Where rivers carve wide basins filled with unconsolidated alluvium, long-duration shaking can cause the ground to lose cohesion and behave temporarily as a fluid, a process known as liquefaction. In steep terrains, a large surface rupture could block river channels with landslide debris, creating transient lakes, changing drainage patterns, and causing secondary slope failures downstream. Surface rupture morphology could include newly formed scarps hundreds of meters long, ground fissures, and local changes in groundwater discharge, such as the appearance of hot or mineralized springs as deep pathways open. Geologists have identified fault systems that are plausible candidates for major shallow ruptures. The Sharman Fault, which can accommodate left-lateral strike-slip motion over many hundreds of kilometers, is capable in aggregate of producing very large displacements if multiple strands rupture together. 
The Central Afghan Fault Zone, a complex of left lateral and thrust faults crossing Central Afghanistan, could rupture in a broad patch from the Bamyan region toward Kabul if a contiguous zone of weakness were to fail. Models that integrate fault geometry, regional stress, and long-term slip rates show that combined or multi-segment ruptures in these systems could approach or exceed moment magnitude 8. Paleoseismic records and historical accounts hint at prehistoric large ruptures in the region, and geological mapping reveals plenty of unbroken fault surface that remains capable of storing and releasing strain. The recent sequence of smaller shocks, including the November 2nd magnitude 6.3 quake near Kulm, can be read as a stress testing of the crust. Moderate temblers in the magnitude 4 to magnitude 6 range that cluster in time and space often mark a change in local stress conditions. In other collision zones, such swarms have preceded larger ruptures by days, months or even years. In other cases, they dissipate without a consequent great quake. The interpretation of such sequences depends on detailed analysis of hypocenter migration, focal mechanisms, and the evolution of aftershock distributions. Even modest deep events can alter the stress field sufficiently to load or unload nearby shallow faults in subtle ways. Timing remains the great unknown. Earthquake prediction in a deterministic sense is not currently achievable. Scientists cannot specify the day or hour of a future rupture with confidence. What the geological record and present measurements do allow is a probabilistic understanding. The longer a major fault has remained locked while plate convergence continues unabated, the greater the potential elastic strain available for release. Continuous geodetic measurements, including the tracking of crustal motion by global positioning systems, indicate that a portion of Afghanistan's crust is deforming steadily and that slow slip or other aseismic release has not accounted for the accumulated convergence. Satellite interferometry over the past decades has likewise shown persistent deformation in the mountainous belt, with little evidence of sustained shallow creep that would otherwise relieve stress. If and when a large shallow rupture occurs, the geophysical signature would be unmistakable. A long rupture plane, sudden offset of the landscape, intense near-field shaking with long-period waves, and a prolonged aftershock sequence that could include many events above magnitude 6. Secondary processes such as landsliding, river damming, and changes in hydrogeology would follow as the landscape reorganizes to a new stress equilibrium. The slab below would continue its own deep processes, potentially producing its own sequence of deep earthquakes independent of the shallow rupture though interactions between deep and shallow systems could persist for years in the form of stress redistribution. Scientists maintain watchful monitoring of seismicity and crustal deformation. Seismologists catalogue each event, determine focal mechanisms, and analyse aftershock decay to infer rupture properties and stress changes. Geodesists measure crustal motion at the millimetre scale where instruments are available and remote sensing complements in situ networks by tracking surface displacement across broader swathes. Together, these observations refine models of fault loading and help identify which fault segments currently bear the greatest accumulated strain. For now, the tectonic map of Afghanistan is a map of stored energy. The epicentre of the recent magnitude 6.3 quake lies near inferred fracture lines that are part of a much larger fault architecture. Each mapped fault is a potential source of larger shakes, 
and the long record of deep ruptures beneath the Hindu Kush stands in contrast to decades of quiet on the shallow, surface-breaking faults. The central geophysical question is therefore not whether the system can produce a very large, shallow quake, but when and where the accumulated strain will find a suitable weakness to exploit. Geology does not deal in certainties of timing, but the mechanics of plate convergence, fault-locking, and strain accumulation make the prospect of a future large, shallow rupture an outcome that is at once plausible and physically coherent. Love this content? Do us a huge favor. Like, share, and subscribe. Then tap that hype icon now to boost the signal and help this video reach a much wider audience.